Can you hear me? Cool. All right, let's do this. So uh, quickly, raise your hand if you know what AngularJS is. OK. Uh, keep them up. Keep them up. Now take it down or leave it up if you've been to the home page, angularjs.org, I think it is. Yeah? If you've done a tutorial, oh, we lost. <laughs> We lost about two thirds of the room. If you've built a toy application on your own, like gone through a demo, what, got about six people, seven, eight, nine. Built a production application that is out there in the wild. <laughs> Getting close. So now we're down to about three, four. Cool. So I'm kind of in that, I'm kind of in that where my hand is like this when. I asked who's put a production application out in the wild. I had the opportunity uh, in April and May to work with the guys at Social Assurance. If, you, if you're familiar with the startup down in Lincoln, uh, Matt Sikowski and Paul Graff are the dev team there. I think Paul's here. Oh, yeah. there he is. Uh, working on their next version of their application, which is uh, built on AngularJS uh, on the front end, Ruby on Rails on the back end. And I talked to Matt today, and I guess it's like this close to being in production. Um, so I can't quite check that box, uh, but hopefully next week I'll be able to tell people I've done that. Um, so I got to play with it a bit and uh, have really enjoyed uh, the framework, enjoyed building the application. I felt like we were very productive in the time I spent with those guys. And so I'm excited to talk about AngularJS here with you guys tonight. Um, this talk is not a getting started with Angular talk, which maybe it should have been because so many hands went down as the demo question uh, came about. But I'm not going to do that necessarily. It's not going to compare AngularJS with Ember.js or with Knockout.js or with Backbone uh, and give a feature breakdown. Those kind of things are out there. They're on the web. Uh, you can see the, you know, the grids with the checkboxes of, of who does what. Um, so I'm not going to do that necessarily tonight. I'm not going to talk about why CoffeeScript is better than JavaScript tonight, <laughs> unless you really want me to. If I have time at the end, maybe it will be a why CoffeeScript is better than JavaScript why talk. <laughs> why? It, I'll just say this, and we'll move on. <laughs> unless you're diametrically opposed to significant white space, you should be trying out some CoffeeScript. If you just can't stand that style, well, then I'll give you a pass. Otherwise, seriously. So instead, what this talk is, it's just a brief overview of Angular's view of the world. Right? All of these frameworks have opinions. They all have things they're better at than others. And I'm going to overview what Angular thinks about the world of client-side application development. And then we're going to actually build a real Angular app together. Uh, it won't be live coding, because that would be foolish. but uh, we will be looking at code. We will be actually going through a development uh, process of an Angular app. It's pretty simple. I'm hoping to be able to fit it inside the time. But I want to do it this way instead of your general introduction and here's how you can download Angular and get an app running. Uh, partially because we've already had the Yoman talk, right? And, because, and so we know how you can get a, uh, an Angular app up and running very quickly from last time. Uh, also, because there's multiple ways of doing that, and it's just not all that interesting, if you're out there trying to decide, is AngularJS something that I want to invest my time in, um, I think this is a lot more useful to see what does it feel like to build stuff with this tool. I've tried out all of the JavaScript frameworks. Uh, I've built toy apps with Backbone. I've consulted on production products with Ember.js. And now with Angular, uh, also way back in the day, JavaScript MVC, back when it wasn't cool. But I don't really know if I want to invest time into a tool until I feel it, right? And so my hope, and I don't know if this will work or not, so you guys can be the judge, but my hope is that we'll build a little thing together, step by step, and you can kind of just feel what it's like to build an application with Angular. The goal being just to pique your interest, so you can go, you know, you can say, yes, I want to invest time in this, or just to turn you off altogether and say, ooh, I don't like the way Angular feels. I can move on and look at something else. So let's talk about Angular's worldview a little bit. I might breeze through this, so slow me down. 
if I'm moving too fast. Angular is obtrusive JavaScript. And that's what it is, and it's very proud of it. I know this was like a bad word four or five years ago, right? Unobtrusive JavaScript is the way to go. Well, Angular is obtrusive, obtrusive JavaScript uh, insofar as they recognize that HTML, as is, is not ideal for building rich uh, JavaScript-based web applications. And so what we really need to do, instead of having all of this keep everything separate, is let's just get in there and let's just actually change our markup. So in Angular, this is just a demo off their homepage of like your very basic Angular app. And you'll see stuff like ng model, ng app, these actual custom attributes that Angular adds to HTML in order to uh, build applications that are more declarative. And maybe this is something that, you know, I, I know when I first saw ng click, I kind of had this guttural reaction, because you'll see that tonight, of, ooh, that's just an on click. Aren't on clicks bad? Because that's obtrusive, and I need to get my JavaScript over here and have a selector and have it bound to an event and keep it all separate. Well, if you're talking about window dressing on an application that's uh, relatively server-side uh, dynamic, yeah, maybe. But if you're going to go all in, you might as well go all in, is what they're saying. And that's what they do. So they are augmenting HTML. Uh, Angular is testable. This was the first thing that made me excited. May or may not excite you. But Angular is built with the foundational thought of this needs to be both unit tested and end-to-end -end tested or integration or whatever. There's like 100 different terms for that. And the ways that it's testable is that it, has, uh, it uses a dependency injection to inject all the dependencies into the context in which you're using them. Um, people familiar, raise your hand if you know dependency injection. Or, OK, pretty good. That's one of those jargony terms that programmers use to like lord over the other one who doesn't know what it is. <laughs> They're like, oh, you don't know what dependency injection is? It's just a very fancy word for saying you pass your uh, you, you pass the things that you need into the context as opposed to like instantiating them right there. So that ends up being very great for testing. It also ends up being a pretty nice way of building applications. So uh, a common pattern we'll see is that testable code is maintainable code. And a lot of that has to do with injecting things. It ships with a built-in mocking library. It builds with a ship. It builds. It ships with a built-in testing library. It uses Jasmine. If you're familiar with the Jasmine JavaScript library, um, which is a spec-style testing library, and it ships with an end-to-end -end test runner. It has its own test runner called Karma. We'll see that tonight. I won't do any end-to-end -end testing on this application, just unit testing, but they think that's very important as well. And so it ships with these things out of the box. And it's just it's built for you to be testing as you're as you're writing your app. Angular is two-way data binding. This sets it apart a little bit from uh, you know tools like Backbone, out of the box Backbone. Uh, this puts it in the same camp with Ember and with Knockout, where you know changing the data in your view will affect your models, and changing the model in your changing the data in your model will affect your views. And Angular is a crap ton of jargon. And that's the big frowny face, because it's a little bit uh, tough to get into, because you see stuff like factories and services, which are very difficult to distinguish between, uh, values and constants, directives, transclusion, which is, I think is the scariest one. It's like, transclusion? I've never even seen that word before. So it has a lot of jargon. This is just some of it. Providers is another one. And jargon starts off you know, as a barrier to entry because you have no idea what the heck they're talking about. Um, also, the problem with jargon, as we find out in the software industry, is different things mean different things to different people. And so my view of a controller is, definitely doesn't map to your view of a controller. And Ember's idea of a factory doesn't map to Angular's idea of a factory. And so the jargon is a little bit difficult. So there's your frowny face, but we can get past the jargon. 
And that's kind of just the high level view of what Angular does. Uh, it's also very easily embeddable. It has nice scoping. Uh, it works with or without jQuery. And a bunch of other things. But for now, let's build an app. So as Zach mentioned, I'm a contributing uh, author of the changelog. Raise your hand if you know what the changelog is. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> OK, good. Now I can pitch it. So the changelog <laughs> is a podcast and a blog uh, whose goal it is is to basically shine a light on open source software. So the podcast interviews uh, the lead developers of many popular open source libraries. Uh, it's a weekly live show that I think runs at like 6 p.m. on Tuesdays, something like that. Uh, and the blog is basically just posting and sourcing new projects, interesting projects, things that will pique your interest or you can possibly use. So uh, it's a great resource if you're looking for new tools or just interesting ideas. It's also uh, an opportunity if you guys have software or projects, excuse me, that you want uh, you know, to get a little changelog love, just let me know because I would love to, you know, to cover Omaha stuff. So that's what the changelog is. And so as an editor of that, an author of that, I'm always looking for cool new projects. And that can become difficult. One of the ways that I look is I watch my GitHub activity. So uh, everybody's probably familiar with their GitHub activity stream. This is an example of one here. And I just watch for what people are starring. I figure that's a pretty good way to find out what's new. I follow people that I respect. They star stuff, and then I check those projects out and see if there's something I want to write about. Problem with this is that there's tons of like comments, right? If you have very active repos, especially private repos, that have issues and that have conversations going on, the actual little guys here get drowned out, and it, it, it just kind of sucks for sourcing stuff. So I wanted to build a little app that probably only scratches my itch. It probably won't scratch any of your guys's, but I want to build an app that helps me find interesting projects using GitHub's API. So the app that we're going to build is called Starlight. And here's my, here's my uh, user story. So as a contributor to the change log, I want to enter a GitHub user into a web page, see a list of users followed by said user, and pick from them to see recently starred repos in order to find great new projects to cover. So that's the, that's the use case. It's a simple one. But I figured it would be enough uh, that would touch enough pieces of Angular to be interesting and yet still be covered in the time allotted. So let's actually build it. If you're online, I did push the repo up to GitHub. So Jared Santos slash Starlight, if you want to clone it and have the code locally, if you have your computer with you. If not, no big deal. So um, first, I'll just show it, to, show it working here. Fingers crossed that GitHub's API is not down again, because it was earlier today. <laughs> so give me a GitHub username. Cody James. No, not me. <laughs> Cody James. Cody, is that right, right there, Cody? I don't know. All right. Yeah. So I enter his username. I type git following. It goes out to the API. It finds all the people he's following. Hey, that guy was just up here. <laughs> and I click on that guy's face, and nothing happens. Maybe he's never starred anything in his life. Is it? <laughs> All right, let's find this one. Oh, there they are. So here's the stuff that Hobbs has been starring lately, which is the basic stats come back at it. Cool? So that's the app. Now let's build it. Um, give me a sec here to get set up. So as I said, this is just a Yeoman, or however you say that, uh, generated Angular application. It's a little bit customized, because I don't like how they do stuff. But 
it'll be pretty familiar. <clears throat> it comes with a Karma configuration. Remember I said that uh, it ships with a testing framework? Karma is the test runner that Angular ships with. Uh, it's pretty nice. I have it set up to run PhantomJS. It will, it'll run Chrome by default, and it'll basically pop a new Chrome you know, browser and run your little test suite in there uh, each time you save a file. That gets annoying to me because I already have Chrome open, but it won't open the same one again. So I like running PhantomJS. And uh, to run Karma, so let's see, over here, it's using Grunt to serve. And so to run Karma, you just run Karma start. And I believe, yeah, there's one test to start off with. So this is the base application you'll find. And it's very simple. Here's your index. Can you guys see this all right? Is it too small? Some of you guys are way back there. Bigger? All right. Better? Cool. So the base application, and basically, I mean, let me hop back over here. That's what we're at right now. So we're not doing anything besides loading up the library and some styles and crap. But we have down here, we're loading AngularJS. We're loading app.js. That's just a basic file that declares your, app, your Angular application. And then we have a single controller called main. What you'll notice here is uh, ng app equals starlight. So that is how you uh, start an Angular application. The cool thing about this, instead of just having it be the entire page, Right? Is that Angular, you can have multiple Angular apps on the same page. So if this wasn't on body, that thing can be anywhere. And you can have a separate Angular app just working on this part of the page and a separate one working on that part of the page. So that's pretty cool. Um, then you have, we see this ng controller here. That's saying that uh, the main control, which we'll look at in a second, is the controller of everything inside of this scope. Now you can nest controllers, but we'll get to that. We may not even get to that. So let's look at app.js. Here's how you declare an Angular app. Angular.module starlight. That's just the name of my app. That has to match up with the ng app declaration over there in the HTML file. And then the second argument is dependencies. So this app has no dependencies, but if you were using something like uh, ng resource or whatever you know, other dependencies you have, libraries people have written, you kind of throw them in this array. And it, uses, it injects those into your, into your application. So there's the app, very basic. Here's our controller. It does nothing. But you can see that in a separate file, we have to get a, a local reference to the app. And then here's your controller declaration. I'm naming it main control. And it literally does nothing. And my test code is about as complex. Here's the spec file for that main control. Now, there's a few things I guess we could talk about here really quickly, is that uh, you can see the injection at work. So you see this before each. If you're not familiar with Jasmine, here's our actual spec. It works. And here's our test code. Expect the scope, which we'll talk about scopes on the controller, to be defined. That's our test. And then all this other stuff is setup code. We, we declare a couple of uh, local variables to use. Before each, we make sure that our starlight module is instantiated. And then also before each, now we inject a root scope and controller into uh, this context. And we set up our scope and our main control so we have access to them down here. Root scope and controller, you see those dollar signs? That's a naming convention. <clears throat> And it uh, speaks to Angular provided services, or services or providers. Again, service, factory, provider, they're basically the same thing. Uh, I'll have, a, I'll have like a link at the end if you want to read what's the difference between a uh, service and a factory in Angular. It's basically like how you declare things. But, but it, just think of it all as objects that you can use. Okay? So a little bit of setup, even though we all, we're just you know, making sure that the scope is defined. But the boilerplate doesn't really bloat too much as you add tests. So that's our base setup. Any questions so far? Feel free to ask them. Not doing anything, so not too interesting. So commit number one is uh, add user form and hook the input up to the user model. So here we'll see our first model. And you can see this commit's way smaller than the last one. 
I'm basically adding a block of HTML. You know, typical HTML form, all standard stuff. The only thing non-standard over here is this ng model, which I'm attaching to a user, which we'll see what that does. And a button to get following, but that thing doesn't do anything yet. And then in the controller, I'm basically just exposing the controller scope to the window scope so I can just toy around with it. Um, that's not really for any reason except for demonstration purposes. So I guess I need to check out this commit here. Yeah. So there we go. There's that. Does nothing. Um, let's pop open the, the deal here. And we can see that all I was doing in the controller is getting access to the scope so we could inspect it. And I can just kind of show you guys this is what the scope of a Angular controller looks like. Um, you don't have to do that. I'll show you the code that exposes that here. So we're passing the, the controller scope into uh, the definition function and then just exposing it to the window. There's a cool Chrome plugin called Angular Batarang, which is this deal. And it allows you to inspect things without having to do these stupid hacks like that. Um, the one thing I did say is that we've bound this input to ng model as user. So this is data bound. So if I get that back open and take a look, you can see that this controller scope for the main control has a model value of Jared, user of Jared. And so Angular models are different than, uh, than what you may think of like a model class. Like if you're doing a tr traditional MVC, where like the model has all this built-in functionality, you usually inherit from it, right? And it gives you a bunch of stuff for free and requires a bunch of stuff from you as well. Uh, Angular is very ignorant about models. It doesn't care very much. It's just JavaScript objects, OK? So I just gave it a name, and I gave it a value, and it says, OK, in the scope, user is Jared. So not much to that commit. Let's go to the next one here. So the next thing we want to do is, right, when we click, I type in Jared Santo into that form and I hit enter or I click get following, it's got to do stuff, right? And so the next thing we want to do is when you do that, the controller should have a get following method that is called and it should call out to the GitHub service, get, this, get the user accounts that that person is following and then load them up into the grid. That's kind of the end goal of the first step. We can see what that looks like here. So on our form, I'm using the ng submit directive which tells Angular to submit this form. When this form f submits, call the get following method. So this is very similar to an ng click, or what you may traditionally remember as an on click, hand, you know, on click uh, attribute. That will call the get following method on the current controller scope. And in the, in the context of this app, everything is just the main controller. That's really the only controller I have. Uh, I'm adding a GitHub service. We'll look at that later. Right now, it's just a stub. And well, let's look at the test. This may not be all that easy to read. Start with the tests here. Let's make sure our tests are passing again. Looks like they are. And let's look at the spec now. So the spec is pretty much the same. Notice now I'm injecting a GitHub object into this context. Now here's where the dependency injection takes place, and it's really easy to test. Because I can basically just tell my test I have a GitHub, and the GitHub should expect stuff to happen and then return stuff. But I, don't have, I have not implemented this GitHub.following method at all. right? I'm test driving this out, so I say, what do I want it to do? And I'm really just specifying my main controller's function right now. I don't want to have to write that yet. And so it's completely detached from the GitHub following call. So what do we do when you click on that ng submit on the git following? Is this controller populates the following model with the results from the GitHub following call. 
This gets a little bit esoteric um, because of how the HTTP service works in Angular, returns promises. I like to return promises also, so I'm basically just doing the exact same thing it is doing. But this code can be a little bit dense. But the idea here is, and you can't see the injection because I have it, I have it blown up too big, but it's injecting the queue service, which is basically Angular's deferred or promises service into this context. And I'm saying, okay, I don't really care what happens when GitHub following. You know, I don't want to test that code because then I'd be coupled. So I'm just going to spy on that. This is standard Jasmine stuff. Spy on the GitHub object, which is really just fake, and the following function. And when this code calls that, instead call this other thing. Now the call fake function, this is where it gets a little funky. I'm basically creating a, a deferred object, resolving it with two empty objects, and then I'm just returning the promise because that's the API you have to conform to. So that's setup code for this. I just want to set up this spy. This is a, this is a mock, mock object. So then I set my scope.user equals Jared Santo. That's a prerequisite for calling get following because get following takes the model. It takes the, uh, the user model and sends it to GitHub. Then I, this is where I'm actually invoking my code, scope.get following. This is more Angularisms, basically because of the way Angular does data binding. Um, you have to actually call apply manually for that to force the call to go through. So just take my word for that. And then after I've done all that, now here's my expectations. Now I expect github.following to have been called with Jared Santo. And I expect my scope, because the whole point of this is to get those following users into my controller scope. Now I expect my controller scope following objects to have a length of two. And how do I know two? Well, because I just put two objects in it up there. Make sense? OK. So right now, like that code works, and you know it's all green and shiny. But my, my app doesn't work, right? Because <laughs> I haven't written that github.following ser service yet. So that's the next commit. I guess I can show you GitHub. That ain't it. So OK, here's my stub GitHub service. So here's how you add your own service. A service is just an object that you can inject into other areas. So I'm declaring a service called GitHub. Inside the, uh, the function for that, I'm basically just returning an object that has a following function that does nothing. It returns an empty array. So is the inject call matching that string against the dollar sign GitHub and knowing to inject this? Close. So the dollar sign is just the Angular built-in services. But it is matching it. Yeah. And there's this whole annotations piece, which if you've seen some of the, especially older Angular code, where when it comes to minification, it loses those variable names. So, you know, I mean, the, the injector code is really like this big lookup table, right? Of like very, of names, and then like here's what you send through that for that name. Um, so it is based on the name GitHub there. And there's a, it used to be that you had to like send in annotated injection arrays, really ugly code all the time, to tell Angular how to map between your variable name and the actual service that you're injecting. Now there's stuff called like ng-min, which is like a project that basically during minification just handles all that for you. It's smart enough to add the annotations. So none of my code has those annotations, um, although you'll still see Angular code in the wild that does. But yes, it is saying GitHub is that GitHub because I named it the same way. So there's some of that, that nice magic going on. Right now, it just returns an empty array. Like I said, this is just a stub so my test would pass. But now let's actually implement that GitHub.following function. And super basic. So here's how you use the GitHub API. Uh, they, they let you do JSONP. So I abstracted out the JSONP URL into its own function mostly because I wrote this twice and I know that I'm going to need that later in the other function. So normally I wouldn't have that abstracted yet, but you know, I cheated. And now the GitHub service following function takes the user login, constructs the URL, the proper URL to GitHub, and then it returns the result of calling the HTTP JSONP promise. And it basically just drills down into the GitHub response. This funky bit is because GitHub returns a meta se section and a data section. And so I'm saying, give me the responses data, and then give me the data section of the data. <laughs> Which looks stupid, but it works. Uh, <coughs> 
Here's our GitHub spec. More, more uh, dependency injection and stubbing, uh, actually mocking going on here. So in my controller code, I'm just stubbing out and I'm mocking my own service. And now I actually have to mock out Angular stuff because my service is the one who's going to be calling the HTTP. Now you may be saying, dude, when you go back to your controller, your controller method, the get following is so simple now. Why don't you just inline that HTTP stuff right here and you're, you know, you're over abstracting this GitHub section? Could be. I mean, for this simple of an app, could be. Uh, in most applications, you absolutely want that layer in between because you want to deal with external services in uh, tightly centralized locations and have everything stuck in there and barrier that around your application. It's just good, uh, good for maintainability. So that would work fine if I just had my HTTP calls that we write in the GitHub service right in here. But then if that thing changes, right, their API changes, or uh, if we want to add a feature, like for instance, this, has, this does not deal with pagination whatsoever. GitHub paginates their results, so it'll give you 50 back, but maybe I'm following 107 people, and I want all 107. Now I need to get my pagination code all up in here, right? And we're going to write the same kind of stuff for github.stars later, and I've got to rewrite my pagination stuff there. So uh, you want to have these layers of abstraction even inside of your own architecture, and so this is just a good idea. So the GitHub spec... is using some built-in, this is the cool stuff that Angular gives you that isn't really out there in other frameworks for testability, is it gives you not just mocking libraries, but like it gives you libraries to mock out their HTTP requests. So that's what we're doing here. We basically send in a fake HTTP backend. Afterwards, we're going to verify that there's no outstanding expectations and there's no outstanding requests. So it's going to do on the front end and on the back end, it's going to verify. And then when we describe our following function, it basically just queries the GitHub API and returns the response objects. Pretty simple. Here's where we tell our fake HTTP service it should expect a JSONP call and return this. Now, I wrote this because I inspected GitHub's responses and I know what they look like. Uh, they have a meta section and they have a data section. And then we just call our function and make sure that the results equal the data section. This is similar to your uh, scope.apply in the other section. This is forcing Angular to send that HTTP request. So with that, I think, I think this code kind of works. It does. So, I, I called that get following function, and now you can see here in my model, I got my user, and I got my following array, and this is all the stuff that GitHub gives you back. So that's working. Hey, Zach, you know when I started? How am I doing on time? Uh, you're doing fine. Right. 7.45. 7.45, all right. Well, let's see what's next. So we got followers coming in, people that I'm following, but we're not doing with anything with them, right? They're just kind of coming into our controller scope, and he has access to them, but that's kind of the end of the story at the moment. The next thing I do is I add a following div, which you can see right there. You can see that. And I'm going to use uh, another Angular directive, which is ng show. So I have this div in it. It's just a header with some you know, fake text. And ng show is an Angular directive that says, show this, you know, apply whatever CSS or whatever you need to do to show this section when this returns true and hide it when it returns false. So the has following is the function that we write. You can pass stuff directly, and you can do expressions right in here. Um, I like to keep it a little bit more separated so I can test that code, even though in the case of a has following, I mean, the implementation and the test are very basic. Here, let's check it out just quickly. So here's our spec, and we don't even need to look at the implementation. 
but it's basically, I have this function on my controller, it's called has following, and it's true when the following stuff has anything in it, and it's false when the following stuff doesn't have anything in it. So there's our oh hi. I don't know why that's, it actually should be hidden right now, I think. Oh, I know. That looks bad. <laughs> Pretty good back traces. Not, not great. But what's happening here is my, my, my tests pass, because all my tests are checking is whether or not this has following function does what it's supposed to do, which apparently it does. If we look at main.js, you know, the actual rep, you know, the actual implementation of that is just to return if the length is greater than zero. The problem is, is that the controller is initialized and the following is, is null when it comes in. And now ng show says, ooh, I need a check has following. It has following says, ooh, I need a check scope following's length. And you can't have a length property of a null object. So the problem is that we just have an initialized stuff. And I think that's my next commit here. Yeah. So set the following model to an empty array during an initialization. So green tests you know, aren't always indicative of, wor of working software. Um, so now when the controller is initialized, let's just initialize the following model to an empty array. And our tests will still be green. And we won't have those errors right away. So now you can see oh hi is not there because ng show returns false on following length. And now oh hi shows up when that model gets populated. Oh, I might skip this one. So basically, I thought it'd be cool to have a little spinny thing so I know it's actually loading. And I wanted to show how you can work with ex, you know, external libraries still pretty easily. So I pulled in this Lada thing, which I don't know if you guys saw this, but I think these are pretty cool buttons. Right, so here's a third party uh, CSS and JavaScript library that just lets you do cool buttons. And I thought, well, let's, let's put that on this. So we have a little loading spinner. And the whole point was to demonstrate that you can do that. And Angular you know, plays nicely with everything else. But we'll just skip that, because the, the implementation is pretty boring. Um, let's check this commit out. And now here we're actually adding the following users, avatars, and logins. So I'm replacing that oh hi section with actual markup. So the same div has the has following ng show. Now it has uh, users in it. So here's ng repeat. It's a really useful little uh, looping construct inside Angular. And it basically says, OK, take this, take this element that you're calling it on and loop over all of the objects inside of the following model, call them user, and then execute this code inside of it. So here's where you, you know, would do your, you know, your for loops, uh, your each loops, whatever iterations you'd be doing in your templating library. Um, so we have this whole section hidden when there's no following you know, objects. And now once there are, now it's going to repeat over that. And it's basically just drilling down into these user objects, uh, displaying stuff. So that's how we get our avatar grid. You might notice this ng source. Um, that's just a special Angular directive used because if you just use the HTML you know, source tag, it will try to load that up at the, on page load, even if, it's, even if it's not showing. ng source is just smarter, and it, doesn't, it just doesn't do that. That was a Stack Overflow one right there. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> He's like, use ng source. And I'm like, sweet. So we can check out that code. There's really no tests added here. But now it's looping over users, displaying their avatars and links. Any questions at this at this point? Everyone's tracking. All right, take your word for it, or your lack of words. <laughs> so we got what do we got going right now? We've got you know you search the user model, it calls out to GitHub, it gets the following objects, it loads them into this grid. 
And then what? Well, when we click on the person's name, now we want to show their stars. That's the end goal. So now we're going to kind of do a very similar thing that we do with the following functions. We're going to use, you know, we're going to write star functions. And we're going to add a click event onto the, uh, the user anchors. The first thing I'm going to do is add this get stars function. Here's where you'll start to see repetition. Let's just open up uh, main spec. In fact, if I get fancy here, ooh, now we can do this. Do that. You can almost see the implementation right next to the test. Almost. So get stars, very similar to get following, right? It populates the stars model with results from github.stars call. Same thing here. I'm injecting the promise library into here, and I'm returning this time three empty objects. This is the kind of stuff that if I was going to actually develop this thing out, I'd abstract these into helper methods. So I would just be like, return a promise, and it would do all this you know, ugly stuff so I, my tests aren't nasty. But same exact thing, scope.getStars, Jared Santo, scope.apply, expect the GitHub services stars method to have been called with Jared Santo, and then expect the length to be three. And the implementation over here is pretty much a lot like the get following, except for that has the whole uh, loading button stuff in it now. But it's basically just calling stars with a login and setting the results to the stars model. I did write these separate differently for a reason. Get following uses the ng model of the user input, and so you're not passing the, the parameter into it. And get stars actually takes the login as a function. Normally, I'd write those to be, the exact, to be the same API, just for consistency. But the reason I did that is just to show you the two different ways uh, you can handle that. So in our index file, just to show you that here's our actual call into the get stars right there. So you can just pass stuff right into your functions. You know, That's one of the things about Angular is like it's just JavaScript. Although I think a lot of libraries say that. Um, so up there, I'm not actually passing it in. I'm getting it off the ng model, uh, off the ng model for user. And here, I'm not setting like the ng model to like star star or something. I'm just passing it in because I have it looped. Just to show you that there's multiple ways to skin that cat. All right. So, oh, my tests are failing. I think this means I need to reset Karma it doesn't pick up those dependencies. I added the LADA tool, yeah. All right. So now we have a get stars function, and it works. It calls the github.stars function. It returns the results. It's very similar to get following. Problem is github.stars doesn't do anything yet because we stubbed it out in our implementation test, or spec. And so now we implement that. And here's where I kind of said I cheated because I knew that this was going to look a lot like that, and there's our common uh, point right there. In fact, I could probably even tighten this up a little bit better, but I ran out of time. So github.stars, same thing, takes the log, and here we have identical APIs, always strive for that. Uh, constructs the URL, calls the thing, returns the data. In fact, they are. Dang, those are the same thing. I definitely would have turned that into a sing single function. But what are you going to do? Uh, I did do one abstraction, one refactoring, I should say. Uh, we'll get to it next. Now we're adding the stars div. This is very similar to the following div, right? It's just to hold the stars when they come in. It has the ng show on it. Here's our get following div. Here's my abstraction or my refactoring. So now following, instead of saying ng show equals has following, I could have left that alone. And down here, I could have said ng show equals has stars and then wrote two of those functions. But they're the exact same thing. They're just checking for the length of the array on the model. And so I refactored that has following into a has any method, which takes the argument of the model that you're checking. So my, uh, my spec changes to adjust for that. 
instead of that has many description, and now I have a has any, and it says it's true when the model name has items. So I set it to one item, I make sure that it has one, or that it's true, excuse me. How does it know to run it again? Like, Each of these it blocks is a, is a, is a threat of execution. What sorry, not the spec. How do you, like, you were having these ng tests, like ng show, how does it know to reevaluate that block with the value? Like, it does do dirty checking, so there's a, you know, there's a loop. Okay. Yeah, it's, that's one of the big differentiators, if you are familiar with Ember and how they go about doing data binding. Uh, uh, Angular does dirty checking, which is a separate thread of execution that says, hey, I'm already looking, and it's, you know, it's doing this. Whereas uh, Ember does getters and setters on everything, right? So you always got to call dot get and then the thing, and that way they can do uh, prop, you know, on property change kind of stuff, which is, uh, performs a little bit better, but it's more complex, and I hate using getters and setters all the time. So that's how it knows. It's basically checking on a loop. That's what that scope.apply does. It tells it to flush that loop through, and so all the changes get set and all the bindings update. So now I have a has any uh, down here. It's empty. Here's my placeholder text. Now when we get stars, you know, we get to a place where there's stars, there's users and stars. But hey, Zach, there you are. Oh, shoot. That's what I hate about this battering. Whenever you, like, turn it on, it just reloads everything. There you are. Oh, no. I don't know what's going on with this thing. Anyways, there's stars in there, because we got the Ojai. That Batarang tool is a little bit buggy. Almost done now. So now let's actually show the stars repo details in table format. Super easy. Set up a table, ng repo, excuse me, ng repeat, repeat, looping over the repo and the stars when that comes back in. This is all hidden when there's no stars in the model. And then it just drills down and it sets the href to the, you know, the owner URL, the repo URL, and all the other stats. At this point, we're like pretty much fully functional. GitHub's API is stayed up. So now that's all the stars coming back from clicking on technical pickles face. And the last thing I want to do is just change this a little bit because I've selected a user. So instead of instructing me to select an avatar, when I have one selected, just show me that like, I'm showing technical pickles stars. So that's the last thing I did there. We look at that. And this is just a combination of an ng show and an ng hide. You'll see these guys hanging out a lot. Notice how little jQuery I've written? Zero, right? It works with jQuery, and you can still use all, of, you know, all the stuff that's, that's all up in jQuery. But you just don't think about stuff. All you're thinking is showing, hiding. They have ng-animate now and some of the newer stuff. Um, it's just a little bit different way to think about it. And so, you know, at this point, I'm not like grabbing a selector and then hiding a section. And then when I see it come back, I'm grabbing that and showing it, right? We're just declaring what the way things should work. And we let our model and our functions uh, return the right stuff. And so you can imagine how the has star function works. Pretty much the same as the other two. A little bit different because it's just checking for undefined. Oh, I will show you that there's a. That to do that, oh, it's way down low. If you can see this, that function is actually calling an angular.isDefined function. So I just added this to show that Angular has a bunch of built in cool little helper functions. You know, if you're used to pulling in underscore all the time because you can't stand, you know, JavaScript's lack of tools. Uh, <laughs> hey, if, if, all right, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> underscore has to exist. That's all I'm saying. Um, they have tons of stuff. Every project I pull in an underscore or whatever because these little helper functions are so useful. Angular's not going to get you all the way there. I mean, they don't have all the cool uh, looping stuff. 
and innumerable stuff, but it does have a whole bunch of like Boolean tests and kind of stuff you can rely on just to clean up your code. So that checks the has star, it shows it. Uh, that's basically the app. Let's hop back over here. I just have a few closing remarks. So this could be better, I mean, obviously, uh, but in a few big ways, like when I clicked on stars, I had no idea if, when I clicked on the person's face, I didn't have the loading indicator. Obviously, I mean, it would have been a good place to put one. Um, that would have been trivial to add. Uh, ng filter on the table, I really wanted to do this, but I didn't have time. ng filter is a really awesome Angular directive that you can use to quickly and powerfully filter data. So uh, I probably will use this tool as is, just because I'm lazy. But if I was enterprising, Oh, uh, he doesn't have very many. But I would have added some sort of table filter in here. And those kind of things, I want to talk about the productivity that we found when I built, uh, when I helped build social assurance. The filtering tools are spectacular. So we could add, you know, filter by language. We could add sorting, uh, that kind of stuff, just using that ng filter directive and some really easy controller functions. So definitely check into that. I would have added that had I had time. But probably best that I didn't because I'm getting long anyways here. Another awesome thing is you click on multiple, as you add people, it's actually aggregating the stars into a single bundle, and then it's having the ones who are star more the ones float to the top, because really that's kind of what you want. Like, here's people, here's somebody that I respect in open source, here are the things that his, the people he's following, he or she, and now I start clicking on those faces, and what are they collectively all discovering? Now I'm discovering things that, uh, that are interesting for sure. So I would do that. But this alone used a bunch of Angular stuff. So data binding, we looked at the injector, we looked at controller scope, the built-in directives, ng model, ng show, uh, ng hide, ng filter, repeat. The HTTP service, which we didn't look at too much, kind of breezed over that, but it's in there inside the GitHub service. Uh, we wrote a custom service, which is super easy to do. Uh, we looked at promises, we, at least we used them. The test runner mocks, stuff we hadn't used. We didn't talk about routing at all. It's got a built-in router, works pretty nicely. Uh, templates, similar template story to most of the libraries out there. Um, they have template offerings. Custom directives, this is where you get into the funky stuff like transclusion, isolate scope, these different scopes. People get overwhelmed by these directives. And you can see that we built a pretty simple app here and we didn't even like talk about that because you don't really need to get into that kind of stuff. That's like you know advanced foo, and once you get really used to it, you'll find where you can write a directive which basically abstracts something that you're doing often inside of your controllers, and really clean up your code. Um, but you just don't have to be intimidated by them. So we didn't use those. We didn't use transclusion, which is, is another crazy term. I think it just means string interpolation inside of a directive. I watched the Egghead video and he did it. And I'm like, that's not very special. But, <laughs> but nobody knows what it means. It's like, why would you pick that word? We didn't look at ng resource. So I, I mentioned that Angular is kind of ignorant when it comes to models. They don't actually, they say they don't force a model structure on you. I would prefer if they actually had more model stuff in there because one of the things I ended up doing a lot uh, with Paul was basically building out our own resource class, which is way more. Uh, robust than anything Angular provides out of the box. They do have ng resource. It's woefully underpowered. It won't do like puts and deletes. It like only does gets and posts. I think it's there's a whole GitHub issue all about adding that kind of stuff in. It doesn't really add you that much. The HTTP layer is really nice, and you can just like tell it to do a git and a post, and so you can build up your own model layers really easily. And I had, actually it was kind of fun. Um, but we didn't use ng resource. We didn't use filters. As I just mentioned, I would have loved to got filters into this app, but just ran out of time. That's it. So a few resources, egghead.io. These are all links. So if you go up to, I'm trying out this new slides thing, which is pretty nifty. Uh, I'll tweet out a link to this slides, but basically just take off that uh, full screen section and you'll get out to these. These are links, egghead.io. Dude does free screencasts. They're all like within seven minutes on all these little topics. And 
he really digs into the stuff that is kind of mystical inside of Angular and helped me out a whole lot in just kind of uh, seeing uh, certain aspects. The official docs are actually pretty good. Uh, I use a Mac app called Dash. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a doc set for Dash, and so I barely ever have to use the internet. Uh, when I'm looking up stuff, the one thing I'll say is like just leave the ng off because like their their search does not like it's you're looking for ng resource you search resource I don't know why, but the official docs are pretty good. I mean I've I've almost made a living off of being really good at reading docs, and so I have a hard time. Uh, I have a hard time actually judging whether or not docs are good because I'm pretty good at parsing them. They're a little bit, I guess, difficult to get into, especially for first starting off, but they're very comprehensive. And then this is the blog post I was telling you about a service versus a factory. If that's something that confuses you, you can check that out. Thanks, my name is Jared. Uh, you can hit me up on all these different places. Uh, my blog, Object Lateral is my company. If you want to email me, feel free. Otherwise, that's it. Thanks.